Welcome to Overcoming Medical Hair Loss. Today I'm with Dr. Keisha Ayers. She is an integrative medicine expert, doctor of sexology, certified trauma informed therapist, a ther certified deaf doula, a board certified in functional medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, and is a founder and medical director of the Academy for Integra Integrative Medicine Health Coach Certification Program. And I'm so excited to have Dr. Keisha here today because she has great experience with autoimmune diseases. So thank you, Keisha, for accepting my invitation. I know today is going to be powerful. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. And thanks for creating this platform for this discussion to happen. It's an important one. Absolutely. So I know, you know, we all have a story and I want to know, how did you get into this work? Well, it's so interesting because I started out as a nurse and from the time I was 19 until I was in my early 30s, I worked in the intensive care unit as a, an RN in, in this kind of high adrenaline junkie kind of an environment. I loved it. I was raising four children. I had um, a happy marriage. I ran marathons. I jumped out of airplanes for skydiving. I mean, I was really, really kind of high adrenaline kind of person and uh, didn't think anything was wrong with how I was living my life until one day. And this is the way my patients describe this experience too, where it's all of a sudden you're, you're sick, right? So healthy to sick overnight. That's exactly what happened to me actually, but it's not accurate that that's what happened. Um, I woke up one morning and I'd gained 10 pounds of puffiness all over my joints and was in so much pain. And it was like, my friends called me the energizer bunny. And it was like someone had taken the batteries out of the energizer bunny and I was just flattened. So I got in to see a doctor and I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease. And when my doctor was asking me my history, she said, do you have any family history of autoimmune disease? And I said, oh, you know, I think my grandfather had rheumatoid arthritis and in fact was in a wheelchair with it for a long time before he died. And in fact, as I was telling this story on another interview earlier, I'm 55 in a couple of weeks and my grandfather died at 54. So, you know, he, he really didn't have a very healthy, happy life. So she said, okay, well, it's genetic, right? Which means close the, close the book, put it on the shelf. End of story. Here are two prescriptions for you. One is for methotrexate and the other is for this very non, a strong non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Take these. And then she said the thing that really got my attention, which was come back when you get worse, not if. And I said, well, hang on a second. You know, like, I make all my own food. I'm very disciplined. I get up at oh dark hundred to exercise every day, run miles and miles. You know, I, I'll do whatever it takes to, to kick this. She said, no, it's genetic. You know, just take your meds, come back when you get worse. So on my way home, I just remember thinking, you know, and this is really interesting because there was nowhere in my history. I always tell my students, like, I would have not known an herb if it had bitten me in the butt. Like, I knew nothing about what we traditionally term alternative medicine. I was strictly Western medicine match pill to symptom. And so I started looking, you know, for something else. And I, I went home and I went into onto my dial up modem computer, because remember, I was when I was 30, and it's, I'm 55 now. So it's a long time ago. And was looking for any kind of scientific literature that would show that there was a different way of doing things besides these drugs. And I found an article on yoga and autoimmune disease. And so the next day I went to my first yoga class. And I, <laughs> the, the, most, the, the funniest part about this is I look out in my background on my deck. I've got these Tibetan prayer flags, right? I called my running partners and I, I said, I'm going to my first yoga class in the morning. I'm really worried. Like I've never hung out with people that chant. I was so conservative, right? Really conservative. And so when I think about that woman and the one that lives today, they, they really wouldn't have known each other or been friends. <laughs> it's so funny. So I wound up um, taking a journey, you know, into from, from my first yoga class, my yoga teacher said uh, in that first class, 
said enough about this word Ayurvedic medicine to get my interest. And I went home and again, looked up this word Ayurveda and I found out, you know, it's a 10,000 year old sister science of yoga. It comes from India. It's a different way of seeing health and wellness. And when, what I was reading was so revolutionary to me, like we're all different. You know, we don't, the same diet, the same herbal regimen, anything is not right for every single person. And also the autoimmune disease is undigested anger. That really got my attention because I was a consummate perfectionist people pleaser. I always say people with autoimmune disease have three P's. They're, they're people pleasers, they're perfectionists, and they're holding on to the pain of past hurt. And so I thought, I'm not angry. And that, that was kind of a clue. Like I could even witness it for myself even at that time. Oh, maybe that's a problem, right? That, that I strap on shoes, <laughs> lace up my running shoes and run for 15 miles rather than actually addressing anger. I just run it off. And that's what I thought I was doing, but actually I wasn't, right? It was going into my body and other things were happening. So, you know, we're talking about hair loss. And at that time in my life, I would put my hair in a ponytail and my ponytail was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And my hairline was receding and receding and receding. And so I'd had, and I had a bunch of acne. Oh, I had so much acne. And I'd been on Accutane twice and had chronic recurrent UTIs. So I had all these, all these really amazing warning signs. I would bloat by the time I got home from my runs, I would have a, um, a big bowl of yogurt with granola and blueberries and walnuts and, and flax over the top thinking I was being super healthy. And it turned out that actually I was really sensitive to gluten and dairy. <laughs> so the granola, and the, uh, so I would bloat by the time I would, it was noon, and I just thought everybody did that, that, that everyone had to undo the top button of their jeans by the time, that, you know, two hours after they'd eaten. I thought that was normal. So there was a lot that I didn't know in those days that I've now started to learn. And in the process of learning how to, I became a yoga teacher and learned how to meditate. And one day I was thinking about this word autoimmune, and I thought, hmm, auto means I'm attacking myself. In effect, I'm actually killing myself in a societally acceptable way. I'm committing suicide, really. Okay, so when's the first time I wanted to die? And the willingness to actually ask that question is what turned everything around because I just remember thinking, I don't want to die right now, but something's in my cells that's indicating this, right? And, and I thought about hair loss as a plane going down and the, you know, everybody starts to get rid of fuel and get rid of everything that's on the plane uh, to save the plane. And I thought that has to be happening with my body right now. I'm just getting rid of whatever's not actually necessary to life and relevant. Mm -hmm. So I started doing this meditation one morning looking for where it was that I wanted to die for the first time. And I went backwards in time and I found this 10 year old little girl version of myself who was being sexually abused by the vice principal of the elementary school. And it wasn't like this was a repressed memory or something that came out of the closet that I didn't know about. I had put it in the closet, but I knew about it. You know, and I thought, I thought I'd already dealt with it because I had this life that looked on the outside to be very, very achievement oriented, productivity oriented, and I was getting what I needed from it, I thought. So I started looking at that little girl and, and she really did want to die. And I saw that. I thought, oh, she didn't understand what was going on. She had no one to turn to. Yeah, she did want to die. So it turns out that actually there's a study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the ACEs study, that talks about this. I talk about it in my book, Solving the Autoimmune Puzzle. And in this study, the CDC conducted it with Kaiser Permanente. It had 17,500 and some odd participants. It was a huge study. It was done between 1995 and 1997. And the reason it was even conducted was because Kaiser had a weight loss clinic that was pretty successful. And people were successfully losing their weight. 
but the clinic director started noticing that a lot of people, even though they were losing weight, didn't go to goal and dropped out early. So he became curious and started interviewing these people and started finding out that these guys, women and men, had been sexually abused in childhood. So he got curious and started wondering, like, what's up with this? And so that's when he, he uh, partnered with the Centers for Disease Control, and they did this big study. And what they asked their participants, and these were all Kaiser members, they asked about 10 different kinds of abuse that you could think of as like capital T trauma. And those, you know, are the things you usually think of when you hear trauma, like sexual abuse, domestic violence, psychological, emotional, spiritual abuse, having a parent that was addicted to drugs or alcohol or some sort of substance or mentally ill or incarcerated or dead or divorced. Like any of the things that watching your mother become um, a victim of abuse, these are all things that they, they termed adverse childhood experiences. And if you checked one, you had an A score of one. If you checked two, you had an A score of two and so on. And what the findings of the study came up with is that the more of those checks that you checked, the higher your A score was, the higher your risk was for all of the chronic illnesses that we see in our society today, from heart disease to autoimmune disease to cancer. And that actually, <laughs> it's all reversible. So, you know, having the knowledge and the insight that, yes, this was a trauma for me, but then you can actually reverse that statistical probability by healing that, which is exactly what I did. I went in and I saw that I had wanted to die at that age, and I thought, this must be correlated. I'll bet I gave myself a message really early on, we now know that it takes anywhere from 10 to 30 years to develop a full-blown autoimmune illness. And so I thought, you know what, I'm sure that my cell said, okay, and gave me a way out, right? So I started doing uh, trauma healing therapy, and within six months, my rheumatoid arthritis was gone, and my hormones were balanced. And I'm, I'll talk about the, the connection between those two. My gut was, you know, was on its way to being healed. Um, I now knew foods that were causing me trouble and I stayed away from those. And over the years, I learned how to stop eating the crap out of my body. You know, I just didn't even realize I was being so awful to it with the number of hours I spent on the road running and how, and this is a very American way of being where we think about, well, I want to weigh this much, or I want to look this way. So I'll do anything to achieve that control over my own body and aging process, rather than being in a collaborative agreement with your body, with an understanding that it has its own consciousness, and asking it what's going on. And when you can do that, you can actually alter your genetic expression. You can alter the way that your immune system responds. You can alter your hormone balance. You can't separate these things like your body and your mind are not separate the way we try to make it yeah so I learned all that over the course of several years and started uh, I went back to graduate school uh, several times now and um, have just devoted the rest of my career to helping others reverse these chronic illnesses that show up in such a variety of different ways and in solving the autoimmune puzzle I put alopecia, you know, autoimmune alopecia in the same bucket as MS or rheumatoid arthritis or Raynaud's disease or eczema or psoriasis or Hashimoto's. Because the way that we think about it in Western medicine is if your immune system is attacking a, a certain part of your body, we tend to just rest with that part of the body, right? And we, we focus on it instead of, you know, if you can think about your immune system as an archer with bow and arrow, and just going to the archer and saying, hey, can you stop shooting arrows instead of running around trying to move the target around so that the immune system can't hit it? And the you know, research tells us that once you have one autoimmune illness, there's a 75% risk of picking up another one. And it's not because you're just that messed up. It's because you haven't really gotten to the root causes. And so that's, that's what I work with is, is really finding and fixing whatever's interrupting the flow of life force energy. And when you think about it, hair, nails, hands, feet, they're not necessary to life. And so the body knows that. 
and tends to get rid of them first, you know? Right. And when you were sharing your story, I was almost tearing up here because it really touches me because I just experienced this. So um, I started a leadership program in November or October, I want to say. And so I do my hair every month. Right now I'm wearing a topper and it's kind of sewed into like my bio hair, which is very little. I mean, you guys can see it here. So, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, and I think it was December uh, when I went to the hairdresser, she takes it off and we're looking at each other. What's happening? My hair is growing back. Mm. And I started crying. She started crying. Everybody there was just what's going on. And I've never seen my hair grow like this, the way it's growing right now. Mm -hmm. And I know it's because in this program, we're dealing with all my childhood trauma. Yeah. And the difference that it made in two months is incredible. I have, I wish I could show you pictures. Maybe I can, I can edit them or show it to you guys. Uh, my sister was there. She has seen me, you know, my actual hair loss and she was there that day. She was floored. Um, so I know exactly what you're saying. And it's just such a blessing to, to know that there is hope and that it's within ourselves. So I it's love what you're saying. Totally true. And, you know, a few years later, I conducted my own study because I had women that were coming to see me wanting hormone replacement a lot. I do, I do prescribe bioidentical hormones. And so the word gets around on the street, right? That they get this from Dr. Keisha and they feel great. They look great. Everything's great. And so I'll have people come in to see me and say, I need hormones, you know, and I'll say, well, why do you think you need hormones? And they'll say, well, my libido is low. I gave a Ted talk about this called, have you heard from your libido lately? And you know, I, then I would ask like these very easy questions, right. That are just rational, logical questions. Like, so when's the last time you had a libido level that you were happy with? And often people would start crying, you know, I've never had one. And I would say estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are not going to bring back or, or instigate libido that's never been there. Or they'd say, I'd say things like, do you like your partner? tears, you know, he's so emotionally disconnected. I live in Seattle. So we're the land of engineers, a lot of software engineers from Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing, Starbucks. And so I have a lot of like, un unhappy, emotionally intelligent women connected to engineer type brains. You know, <laughs> They're just like, ah! and so I would say this is not a hormonal issue, you know, and, and so the tie in, because it's so interesting. It's it's moving along that same train of thought of matching pill to ill. And so if you think about like what hormones are, hormones are messenger chemicals that your body uses to communicate. And it starts with the, the messages that come from your mind. So it, you know, in effect, your hormone balance is actually regulated by how you perceive your world everyone and everything in it and your own safety and sense of worth. So in other words, if you are hypervigilantly looking around, making sure you're safe, you're going to, and you, and you don't trust that you are safe or that other people are trustworthy, you're going to find that because that does exist, right? If you're feeling like, okay, I'm a co-creator in my world and whatever happens that's challenging for me, including hair loss, um, is just another gift of life to help me learn new skills, then you're not going to feel victimized by that. And that's going to send a different set of neurotransmitter messages from your brain to the rest of your body. If you're feeling like I can never catch a break, every, you know, this life is too hard. Um, I feel trapped in my marriage. I feel trapped by X, Y, or Z. Then that's going to have that fight or flight or freeze frame to it. That will be another set of biochemicals, neurotransmitters that get released from your brain. So these are always, always regulated by your own perceptions of yourself and your place in the world. 
So if you feel secure and worthwhile, you're going to have those rest and digest hormones that are running around in your body. So you're going to digest well, and you're going to be able to feed and breed, we call it, right? So that means your, your hormonal balance that has to do with sexual reproduction will be a lot healthier. But if you're a zebra being chased by a lion and you think you're about to get eaten, it actually, you're wired to know that if you have a lion on your tail, it's not safe to stop and poop and it's not safe to stop and have sex. So your body just naturally very wisely shuts all that down. And that's when hair loss actually happens is because that's the part of the plane going down and, it, and your body getting rid of stuff that it doesn't have the resources to take care of. So in Ayurvedic medicine, actually hair is called excrement. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. like, it's supposed to be one of the things that comes out of your body that carries trash. That's why you can do a hair mineral analysis or you can measure metals in it, you know? So hair is not even, you know, something that the body considers important at all. Your brain, your thyroid, your lungs, your kidneys, your liver, your heart, those are important, right? So, you ha so when you think about it that way, then you can realize like, oh, if I'm constantly giving my adrenal glands the message that I am, uh, I am in danger, I'm not going to survive, that cortisol is actually made from the same root hormones that estrogen and progesterone and testosterone are made from. So pregnenolone, which is made from cholesterol, actually makes the same cortisol or your reproductive hormones. So it comes off of a branch and it'll make a decision. Do you know, is the body safe enough to reproduce? Okay, then I can make estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Is it feeling unsafe? Nope. So then it goes to cortisol. So you're going to have your body reallocating resources the same way you reallocate money if you're in a financial constraint. You're not going to be buying expensive things if you can't put food on the table. That's how your body thinks about it. So hormones are always just a part of the puzzle. They're not the end game. So a lot of times people with, with medical grade alopecia will be very frustrated because they will have really worked with their hormone balance for a really long time, but they haven't realized that actually this is also an immune response. It's a reaction to the foods they're eating. It's also what's going on in their perceptions and what's happening around, I always call it the food for thought. So uh, all of it has to be digested. And that was a gift from Ayurveda for me is to understand that my emotions, my memories, my beliefs, my experiences all have to be digested in the same way that the food that I put in my mouth is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can totally relate to, relate to that as well. So um, I'm originally from Colombia and I moved here when I was 16 and I left home really early, I think like the year after. So I've been on my mm -hmm. own since I was 17. So I was learning the language. I was on my own, you know, just alone or that I felt alone, right? For you know, Just a little bit stressful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a little bit. <laughs> Two years later, I started losing my hair. Yeah. And so, you know, and that gave me more stress, you know, and then that. Led That's what people don't realize. Like if anyone's ever had fertility issues, they know that then having a period is a trauma every month. Right. If you, if you have some sort of chronic illness, then it in and of itself becomes the trauma. Yeah. Right. Every time you look at yourself in the mirror and you don't look the way you want to look, it re-traumatizes you. So yeah. now, you know, it, it's compounded interest with the other things, like the things you just mentioned that you'd gone through. And yeah. it just keeps on that circle of trauma. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's part of our cultural, I call it the marinade that we're all steeped in is we, we have cultural trauma to begin with. And we have capital T trauma, which is the stuff I talked about with the ACEs study, the stuff we usually think about as traumatic. But then we also have lowercase t trauma, and everybody has this. Mm -hmm. And that's when you do feel alone or you feel rejected. You don't have a tribe. You have to think about, like, in early days of humanity, if you were put on the outside of the firelight circle – because the tribe rejected you, then there's a very high probability you get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So we're actually wired to understand that, that 
if we're rejected by another, it's experienced as a trauma. And there is not a child alive that hasn't experienced rejection or had some kind of story. You know, you have yours of moving and feeling, I lived in Japan when I was a child and didn't speak the language. The kids would tease me because apparently Keisha in Japanese means steam train. And I didn't know that. So I'd get on the bus. I was the only white girl. And all these Japanese kids would start chanting, Kisha, Popo, Kisha, Popo. Oh. And I would cry. I was only six, right? Because I didn't know what was going on. And they were, they were just having fun with my name. They were doing the steam train sound, right? And I didn't know because I didn't speak the language. And so it was like this whole bus every morning. And you think about that. And that my experience of that would have set up this freeze inside. Most children experience not fight or flight, but freeze because we're powerless. And, you know, I'm trapped on a school bus and frozen, right? Because all these kids' attention is directed to me and they're obviously laughing at my expense and I don't know why, right? So, so the, the piece around that is not, oh, poor you, you know, but, oh, that's where it got lined up in the body, right? So then anytime someone comes along later, and this is what my hurt study showed, is you have this initial experience that you can't navigate, you can't explain. And it doesn't necessarily have to be sexual abuse or immigrating to a new country or not speaking a language. It can be failing your first test in school. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, or losing friends you thought you had the day before or trying to figure out where to sit in the cafeteria at lunchtime, right? It's like, there's so many of them. And in that moment, you're going to experience something in your body that is associated with a fight, flight, or freeze. It could be panic. It could be fear. It could be terror. It could be anger, sadness, hurt, grief, right? Disgust. Any of these feelings and then people can come along and push that button later over and over and over again. And you're going to have a behavior and a meaning that you attach to that really early. Mm -hmm. You don't have a prefrontal cortex that is a fully adult brain until you're 26, mm -hmm. which is the, the part of your brain that is the one that makes adult decisions, mm -hmm. what you're going to eat, who you're going to hang out with, how you're going to spend your money, right? This is like all adult decision making, which doesn't come online until you're 26. So when you're young and you're going through these naive experiences that you've never had before and you don't have anyone to help you navigate them, which is normal, there's no one ever has a well-attuned, fully attached caregiver with them by their side 24-7 to help them navigate these things when they're young. And so you're going to make up some meaning with the wise mind of the child that's immature that fits in that moment. Mm -hmm. So like with my sexual abuse, I said to myself, okay, the vice principal's telling me this is my fault, that I'm a bad kid. So the meaning I made up about that was that I'm a bad kid. I must not know how to read a situation somehow. So the belief that I created from that meaning was that I needed to be perfect to even survive. Mm -hmm. So then the behavior, so this is how it works. You have a meaning, a belief, and then you have a behavior that's adaptive to that belief and meaning. The behavior I created that ran me until I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis was perfectionism. Yeah. You know, and I was pretty perfect at being perfect. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, like I know anyone with autoimmunity has this perfectionism and people pleasing, you know, stuff going on. So it was it was really interesting and to be able to sit back and go, oh, so I get to go back and I can actually redo those meanings and those beliefs and then redo the behavior. Mm -hmm. So part of what I did, I was telling you off air, was when I was in India in 2005, I had this amazing spiritual experience. And I decided that I wanted, I was in this little tiny room with a travel backpack and hair about, it was blonde and the same, the same length that it is now. And I had a Swiss army knife with those little tiny scissors and some powdered dish or laundry soap <laughs> and a disposable razor. And I decided that I wanted to get rid of all attachment to out external, you know, appearances that I really wanted to work with attachment. 
and attachment to this body and the way that it looked. So throughout about a three to, I think it took me about three hours in the night, I sat with those little tiny scissors and I totally cut all my hair off. And then I used the powdered laundry soap with some of my bottled water, <laughs> put it wow. on my head and used a Bic razor to shave it. And I had these cuts and nicks everywhere. It was such a mess. And went around India for the next few weeks and then at home with uh, just keeping no hair. And what I realized is that I behaved differently, that it wasn't anything to do with my hair being gone. It was actually my perceptions of myself and my world, that I wasn't as gregarious, that I didn't immediately move into a situation with my heart open and my smile on my face, that I was shy and I was worried about what people thought of me. And so I vowed to keep my hair bald until, or non-existent, until such time that I could completely have my self-worth, my, I call it your worth meter, my worth meter on the inside of me rather than on the outside so that nobody could influence it. And it didn't matter what I looked like or what I was dressed like or how I appeared in the world, that my worth would stay at 100% no matter what anyone else reflected back. It took a while. And it was a very focused, concentrated practice for me too. Um, And it still took a while to be able to just be like, you know what, whatever you think of me is none of my business. You know, you've heard all this stuff, right? And, and to be able to, to notice how I behaved differently with how I looked, not anyone else. And so I started working on that, working on being friendly and gregarious and not, not caring, you know, about what I thought about me, Mm -hmm. um, let alone what somebody else thought. And I got home and my kids when I got home from India, they didn't recognize me, of course. And I had pierced my nose. I had shaved my head. <laughs> I was dressed in Indian garb. And my seven-year-old daughter, I had thought about shaving my head when she was still in preschool. And I had asked her, would you be okay if mommy shaved your head? I want to kind of play with, you know, like not having looks be a thing. And she had said, you can't come to pick me up at preschool if you shave your head. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I had said, Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so then when I was in India, she was seven. And when she saw me, she was like, you did it. <laughs> I said, I did, honey. And I said, you also are going to have to work on what you worry about what other people think about mom. <laughs> mom. <laughs> and by darn, she did, you know, and we did it together. And it was, it was a really interesting, fascinating um, journey my my oldest son wound up shaving his head too and we all just I just said it's an amazing experience to really shift how you you had to notice how you change in response to your hair not anyone else yeah um I was also sharing with you offline that I try that um a week before New Year's and so I went out without my hair for like three to four days. And the first day I felt amazing. I felt, I don't know, it it was just this this power, this just authenticity. You know, I wanted to talk to everybody and people were like, what's wrong? And I'm like, there's nothing wrong. I'm just excited. There's, you know, there's this excitement and um, then showing up as me. Right. And so what I do think, and I do believe is a daily practice. I don't think it's something that you do once and then it it goes like, or, or you get better like that or no, it's a daily. That's what I noticed. Yeah. Yeah. That every time I traveled to a new place, people would get to know me and then I was comfortable and then I'd wind up in the new place and I'd wind up being in the same space again. Like, Oh, what are people, you know? And I, and so I had to, I just, decided like I'm staying bald until I can get under this because the thing that I you know so fascinating I think women in particular well men do too but but all of us we have the I I believe a mandate to learn how to show up as wise women and wise man elders and you know you can look at our government today you can look at corporate America And the value system that we have is on productivity and achievement. And that is not like if if you think about like when you die, what you're going to look back. I've had three near death experiences in my life and I can guarantee 
none of it was about my hair and none of it was about what I'd achieved. You know, what I looked at when I was doing a life review and every single one of those experiences, one was being struck by lightning. And, and as I was looking at the body down below me, I wasn't judging the way it looked. You know, I was actually in a fully different experience with what, what life on planet earth had been. And so, you know, it's, it's really owning. Sometimes I think beauty can be a distraction. Yeah. I always feel really, really compassionate for people that are drop dead beautiful, um, that have been beautiful for their whole lives. And that's their currency because that is going to go away. Mm -hmm. So I had a patient in my office last week who was talking about some weight that she gained and the way that she spoke about herself was with such repugnance. Like she said, I can't even see my knees anymore because they're so fat. And I just remember like the, the hatred that, that she felt about her body and about her knees. You know, I can't, I can't show my legs. And I said, well, why can't you show your legs? Because I can't even see my kneecaps. Well, who cares, you know? And, and that, that was the thing is we have this, this form that we think we have to conform to that is societally acceptable to the point that people will inject their faces with Botox and go under the knife to change and alter their bodies instead of really working on changing and altering their perception and perspective of what life's beauty and bounty actually offers. And so I was helping her with that. And by the time she left, she said, Oh my gosh, ah, she said, I keep forgetting this message. That's why I keep coming back, you know? And, and it was pouring rain outside. I live in the Seattle area and you can see behind me, it's pretty gray. And she said, I've just get so locked in on this rain. And, and so then we worked on that and I said, you know, this rain is actually the most remarkable amazing blessing because water is what keeps us alive you know if you live in another place in the world water is a big problem and you know in just a few short weeks this place is going to be the most brilliantly emerald gorgeous teeming with life you know mother gaia landscape and i said it's just really altering your perception that then changes your hormone balance that then makes it so your body doesn't want to retain its weight as long as you think you're a zebra being chased by a lion, you don't lose weight. You lose your hair. Your hormones go sideways. You start having joint pain. You start, start getting brain fog. Like all these things are actually the way you perceive. And so that's, that's where the faucet starts, right? So that becomes, you know, and, and so then I always say, like, live into your wise woman elder with all of her her badges of honor, her wrinkles and her gray hair. My gray, I'm starting to it's coming in and I'm so excited. It's silver. I don't know if you can see it, but my birthday's in a couple of weeks. I'll be 55 and I've started seeing like, Oh, I need to wear glasses every once in a while now. And, and, um, I I'm going through menopause. I haven't had a period for a few months now and I'm getting gray. And it's just like, I wouldn't change that for, anything I would never be 20 again because I have so much more wisdom than I had you know and I'm so much happier and so it's it's like learning how to let go of what the exterior experience is and then all of a sudden the internal starts to shift absolutely yeah. and actually now that you mentioned that when when I had this experience at, at my hairdressers uh, I want to say a month ago um I asked her because I'm not doing anything anymore I'm really, I'm not treating anything. I stopped doing treatments. I let go of everything. So I said, Fiorella, what's happening? I don't know why my, like, why is it growing back? And she said, Valerie, do you remember the first time you were here? What was the first thing you did? You closed the curtain. You wanted to hide. You didn't want anybody to see you. Now you walk in here. Do you care? No. The doors open, windows open. People have come in. They have talked to you. You don't care about this anymore. It's not, and you, you, it's not, it's not who you are anymore. You let go of that. Not That's causing trauma. Yeah. 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 And I, I tell this, and I'm sure everyone's heard this before too. Like I'll have women that I'm helping with fertility problems and I'll say, start filling out adoption paperwork and, and really stop being attached to having a baby. I'm going to help you with all of the issues that are in the way, but 
just assume you're not going to be able to get pregnant and start working on that and start grieving it and start, start healing from it. And, you know, I haven't had one patient in all of my history and my medical practice that hasn't eventually gotten pregnant. And it's because like they stop focusing on it, you know, which, which creates that fight or flight, right? They stop having a period become a trauma. So it's, it's when you keep re-traumatizing yourself over and over and over again, that this won't heal. I know. Well, Dr. Keisha, thank you so much for being with us today. I know that you do have a special gift for our audience, correct? Yes. So I believe it's Fatigue to Fabulous. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I wrote this little book that um, the, the, one of the things that Ayurvedic medicine teaches, and it's in my book, Solving the Autoimmune Puzzle, is this um, idea that you're more than your physical structure. And so there are five layers in Ayurveda, they call it the pancha koshas. So you have your physical body, your energy body, your emotional, mental, spiritual body. And if you're toxic in any of those layers of yourself, then you're not going to have access to what Jungian psychology calls, calls like the collective unconscious, right? Which is the place we all love to hang out. It's where all wisdom is. It's why there's never, no one ever invents anything new. It's all there. We just download it, right? We have access to it. So we, we get unhappy and upset when we're toxic in each, any of those layers. And this book goes through ways of detoxing each of those layers and swapping out. Like instead of using chemicals, here's a way of um, using something else instead of a chemical like red food coloring. You can use beet powder, you know, and I, I just go through and I talk about all kinds of different swaps for food, swaps for the way you think, swaps for your energy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes through and it's, it's ways of really up leveling your energy um, by feeding each one of your bodies exactly what it needs to be nourished. I love it. I can't wait to try it myself. So thank you so much for being with us today. I, you dropped so much knowledge. I cannot wait to see you. I'm going to come see you in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> thank um, you. Again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Hi, everybody.